Acts, the book of Acts, is a book of action. And maybe that's why I like it so much. Um, I don't sit still very well. Um, I've just always been somebody on the move, I guess. You know, I, the older I get, I like to sit a little bit more, but uh, I still just have, you know, a lot of energy. But the, the book of Acts is a book of action. There's something going on. And uh, perhaps that's why I'm drawn to it. But tonight, uh, as we saw last week, uh, we saw the decision made by James and the apostles and the brothers there at the Jerusalem Council concerning the Gentiles and salvation. And uh, the question was, in order for the Gentiles to be saved, did they have to have faith in Jesus Christ and be circumcised and follow the law of Moses? And so they came together in Jerusalem to, to discuss this matter. And we'll recall that the decision they came up with is we'll begin in verse 19 tonight and we'll finish uh, the chapter. But we'll recall the decision was that we would not trouble them concerning their faith in God. That uh, their faith in Jesus Christ alone is what counts for salvation. And uh, that's true for anyone that's saved. If you're born again, it's your, you're saved by grace through faith. And it's not any mixture of works to be saved. And so they came to that conclusion for the Gentiles also because there were uh, believing Jews who thought they had to follow the tradition of circumcision and following the law of Moses. But this passage of scripture that we're dealing with tonight uh, shows us some details concerning how they communicated with the Gentile churches this matter. Uh, they were sending a letter, as we'll see tonight, uh, via some of the apostles and brothers to let them know the decision that had been made based on what the word and the spirit of God had told them. And so they send a letter to the Gentile church churches to let them know what was decided. And this passage tonight also deals with Christian liberty, that we should not use our liberty as we please, but that we have liberty to abstain from practices that may offend a brother or sister or be a stumbling block to them. We're also going to tonight see a contention, a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Yet two men who served shoulder to shoulder in such a spiritual battle of that first journey could actually have a disagreement, but they did. And I believe we're going to see tonight how to disagree graciously, how these men disagreed graciously. You know, tonight as we look at the Word of God, we're going to notice that in life, and I think we already know this, that we're going to disagree on matters from time to time. Even the two people in the church who agree most on most things, they still have disagreements. They still have differences, different opinions on matters. The question for us tonight is, will we be pleasing to God even in our disagreements with our brothers? Because there is a way to disagree graciously. And I believe we'll see that tonight in the Word of God. Let's go ahead and look at the Word. Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 19, picking up where we left off last week. James says, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barsabas and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye will keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by their brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Let's pray tonight. Father, as we now look into your holy word, Lord, our hearts have already been blessed by the singing and the fellowship, the special music, Lord. And now as we settle and focus our hearts into your word, I ask that you would, Lord, speak to us concerning these truths that we're going to see tonight. Lord, the liberty that we have, it's not to be used to do as we please, but to be used to please you. And Lord, that when we do have disagreements with our brothers, that we would disagree graciously. Lord, I pray that you would allow the word of God to speak to each heart tonight. Lord, that you would be real to us. God, that you would, as we leave tonight, that we would know that we have met with you. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. They have now come to a decision, and they're getting ready to inform the Gentile churches of that decision. And we notice in the first two verses, in verses 20 and 21 tonight, we notice that there is liberty to abstain. Liberty to abstain. Now that, that sounds contradictory. Usually if you'd have liberty, you're free to do whatever you want. But as Christians, we're given liberty not to do as we please, but to do as the Word of God teaches us. And also to have a, a friendship or a unity with our brothers and sisters. Not to use it as an occasion to cause our brothers to stumble in their Christianity. To keep peace between the Jew and the Gentiles, the Gentile believers were encouraged to be considerate of their Jewish brothers and to abstain from three things. Let's look at what the word says here, verse 20. But that we write unto them that they should abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. These things they're to abstain from are very big deal to the Jews. Leviticus chapter 17 verses 10 through 13 will tell us what the Bible has to say about these issues of eating things offered to idols and eating things strangled and eating the blood of an animal. It wasn't supposed to be eaten because the blood is the life thereof, the Bible says. And it was a very a strict code that the Jews followed. And the Gentiles were given a letter to tell them there are some things that we ask that you do because these will be a stumbling block to your Jewish brothers. The first one was pollutions of idols. Abstain from pollutions of idols. Refraining from eating food that was offered to idols. They would offer sacrifices to false gods. Pagan people would. And then they could sell that very meat in the market to people that they could purchase it and take it home and, and eat it. 
And the Jews saw this as idolatry. They would not partake. And there the the admonition here to the Gentiles is just because you have liberty within Christ and this is a foreign concept to you, don't use it as an occasion to do what you want, but think of your Jewish brothers who this may cause to stumble. The next one was to abstain from fornication. God's moral law was to still be followed. That we didn't have liberty and license to do as we pleased in the physical sense with another person. That moral law was to still be followed. Very clear about that. Those kind of practices were ingrained in pagan religion. And there was something the Gentiles need to hear with that is not okay. The Bible says the fornication is sin and that you are to abstain in that, from that as a believer in Jesus Christ. The third thing was do not eat animals that have been strangled or do not eat animals' blood. The idea here is to be considerate of your Jewish brothers. The Jews were not to force Gentiles into circumcision, and the Gentiles were not to use their liberty as license to cause a Jewish brother to stumble. This was to promote peace among the churches. Moses is still being preached, it says in verse 21. In the synagogues on every Sabbath day, Moses is still being preached. He's speaking uh, part of those people were Jewish people, and he said, you know, don't, don't be offended, don't be afraid. Moses is still being preached. We're not trying to do away with the Old Testament, but he's still being preached. When I think about this admonition to have peace among churches and, and among cultures, is really what we're speaking about. You know, cultures and traditions among Christians today are different. I've never been, but I'm sure people who've been to see Brother Sam Varghese could tell you that the traditions for Indian Christians are different than the traditions here in America. I have had the privilege of going to a couple places. I was able to go to the Virgin Islands on a mission trip. I know, suffering for Jesus. But I remember when we got to the church there, it was quite different than where we had church. The building was smaller and didn't really have air conditioning and most of the people didn't wear a tie. When they got up to sing, they had a guitar. That was weird to us. We were used to a piano and an organ. But they had a guitar and they also had a guy who had a tambourine. And I remember as a teenager thinking, this is about the most godless thing I've ever seen in my life. It's pretty judgmental on my heart. And then we got to our first service with this church. It was Cruise Bay Baptist Church in the Virgin Islands on St. John Island. And we got to our first service, and they began to sing. And the fellow was up there playing the guitar, I mean, just sweating bullets. And the other person had the tambourine there. And, and guess what else they started to do? They started to clap during the singing. And I thought, oh, no, we've really lost it now. This, this can't be of God. And I remember looking at my youth leaders to see what they would do. How would they handle that? Would they get up and walk out in this godless act, this worship rock and roll that they were playing there? And I watched my youth pastor, who's about as straight as they come. He preached here last year, begin to clap his hands to the music. And so I clapped my hands to the music too. <laughs> and we enjoyed it, man. And we enjoyed singing with them. We had a time. Now, when we came back to the States, we didn't bring a guitar and a tambourine. And we didn't clap and, and do those things. But you know what? There's different cultures, and different cultures do different things. There was nothing sinful about what they were doing. It was a different tradition, different way of doing things. And it would have been inconsiderate of us, as their brothers in Christ, to have walked out of that church and said, when you're finished singing, we'll come back in. That doesn't promote peace and unity. And that's what they're saying here. There will be cultural differences. There will be traditions that will be different. But there are some things that are always the same. The matter of salvation, always the same. And there are some things that still need to be followed, particularly some of those moral laws like fornication. It is not, we do not have liberty to engage in fornication. And let's take it a step further, they said. There are some things that will trip up or cause your brothers to stumble that may be okay for you, but don't do it being considerate of others. I remember when we went to Belize, a similar situation. 
I, we went down to meet the pastor there. We had breakfast with him, and we were talking about the services and going out visiting. And I remember saying, you know, typically when we go visiting, when we go to church, we wear ties. And he kind of looked at me, and he said, I understand. We, he said, I did too when I went to church in Kentucky. He said, but down here we don't do that. Well, first of all, I know why. It is extremely hot in Belize. And when he said we don't wear ties, I said, praise the Lord, you know, because I didn't want to have this thing around my neck in a little building with no air conditioning with 100 degrees and 99% humidity, you know, stuffy, you know, I, and I was just thankful about that. But I remember saying, but now when we go visiting, you know, we want them to know that we're God's people. So, you know, do you want us to wear ties? He said, not only do I not want you to wear ties, I want you to dress like you're going to church. And I said, that's what we do at church. He said, no, like, you're going to my church. I said, well, how do you dress at your church? He said, well, I wear a pair of pants and a, and a shirt with a collar on it. He said, but most of our people wear shorts and T-shirts because it's 100 degrees in the building. And he said, the other thing is, if you wear a tie when you're going on somebody's house to give them the gospel, that's what the false religions down here do. They all wear ties. He said, so you won't even have a person open a door if you approach their door in a tie because they'll assume you're one of those false religions. It really opened my eyes. And as much as it pained me, I deferred to my brother because he lives there. He's the pastor of that church, and when I leave after a week, he's going to be there dealing with those people. That was their tradition. That was their culture. And so for a week, we did that. And guess what? God's still blessed. <laughs> people were still saved. God did miraculous things that week. And the idea is, don't be inconsiderate of other brothers and sisters' traditions and cultures. Like we said, there are some things that we don't compromise on. The Word of God, the doctrines of the Word of God, we don't compromise on those. But on when it comes to matters, secondary things that we may call, don't be a stumbling block and be inconsiderate of brothers and sisters. And that's the tenor, that's the idea of the thrust of this letter going to the Gentiles. You know, we're going to disagree on matters from time to time. The question is, we will be pleasing to the Lord when we disagree. The next thing we see here in this passage, the message is sent. They decide to send the letter. In verse 22, we see that they send the letter at the hands of Paul and Barnabas and also Judas and Silas. It's very wise of the men to do this because if they just sent Paul and Barnabas, all the Gentile churches may assume, and the Jews hanging around, may assume that Paul and Barnabas were just making it up because, of course, they were friendly to the Gentiles. But they didn't just send Paul and Barnabas. They sent men from the church in Jerusalem to verify the message was indeed true. Very wise move. They were there to validate it. Notice verse 27. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. It was to validate and verify the message. It's not just Paul and Barnabas. This is what the Holy Ghost has told us all to do. Very wise move. So they go, they send these four men specifically with the, the letter. In verse 23, the Gentiles, I love this. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. I love this because here's how, what they're saying. In our vernacular, they're saying, we are sending this letter to our brothers who just happen to be Gentiles. You see, they didn't make the matter about their difference. That maybe we're Jews and you're Gentiles. They didn't put that line in front of them anymore to separate their differences. What they said was, this is to our brothers who just happen to be Gentiles. I love that. How God just directed their hearts to have a heart of peace and a heart of unity. Hey, we're coming as brothers, not as Jews from the church at Jerusalem, the famed church at Jerusalem where all the apostles and pillars are. No, you're our brothers. And it just so happens that you're Gentiles. I love that. Promoting peace and unity. Verse 24, they set the record straight. They said, for as much as we have heard, that certain which out, went out from us have troubled you with words. They troubled them with words, teachings, 
that, look at, look at this verse, subverting your souls, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. They said there were men who came among you, and they taught you things that we told them not to teach, or we did not tell them to teach those things. So they set the record straight. By the way, there are people out there who will try to teach things that are not correct. And that's why we need to know what the Bible says so that we can set the record straight. It's not just enough for the preacher to study, although he should. It's not just enough for the teacher to study, although he should. We all should know what thus saith the word of God. So that we can know the difference between a false teacher and the truth. And they said, there are false teachers. There are people who were teaching things that we gave them no command to teach. And then in, verses, in verse 25, it says, we, it seemed good for us to assemble and we've sent a letter to you. Our beloved Barnabas and Paul, verse 26, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. What were these men's credentials? Nothing but that they hazarded their lives for Jesus Christ. These were men who were soldiers of the cross. These were men who fought the spiritual battle. They put their lives in harm's way for the sake of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So hear them. We've also sent other brothers who will tell you the same message is true. And then, in verse 28, do you notice the wording? For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Do you like the order there? They didn't say it seemed good to us, and by the way, the Holy Ghost let us know he was in on this. No, that's not how they termed it. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost. We watched him move. We watched what God was doing. And as we saw God move, we got in line. Amen. As we see the word of God and as we see the spirit of God leading, we get in line. The Holy Spirit guided these leaders. And I want to say this. Spirit-filled and spirit-led leadership is a wonderful thing. And we see that in this passage. These men were led by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. They had both of those things to their verification. As leaders in the church, if you find yourself in a leadership role at Central Baptist Church, it is important for us to be Spirit-led and Spirit-filled. It's not, again, just the job of the pastor to be Spirit-filled and Spirit-led, although he should be. Every leader ought to be Spirit-filled and Spirit-led. And chiefly hold to the word of God. And these men were writing to say that they had followed God. It's a wonderful thing when leadership follows God. And it's a very damaging thing when leadership does not follow God. That's why we ought to pray for our spiritual leaders all the time. Pray that God will give them wisdom and help them to follow his word and his spirit. It's very and vitally important to the health of a church that we follow God and his word. Well, we notice that from this letter, these brothers were consoled. They give them the, the letter, they read it to them. And in verse 30, so when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and they had gathered the multitude together and delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. They took a deep breath, and they said, praise the Lord, we're saved we don't have to be under some kind of tradition. We don't have to become basically a Jew because we're saved by grace through faith. What a wonderful consolation it must have been that these men all along were saved. That God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God was within them. They were consoled. Verse 32, they were given the news by Judas and Silas also. With many words they confirmed them. They left no doubt. And then in verse 33, and after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. And it starts something. 
What it started was what I think was a Bible conference. Look at verse 34. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Now, wouldn't you like to have been a part of that? You want to talk about a revival or a Bible conference or a missions conference? You want to talk about a time to be under the word of God? We had many men, godly men, spirit-filled men, teaching and preaching the word of God for a space, for a time. They were there teaching and preaching. They took the opportunity to unite them under the word of God. And as we talk about liberty and unity tonight and disagreeing graciously, we do need to know that all those who agree, you cannot walk together, the Bible says, unless two be agreed, they cannot walk together, Amos 3.3. 3. You have to agree to walk together. There are some religions, some denominations who are incorrect on matters of doctrine. We can be in disagreement with them and still be Christian about it. We can still keep our testimony and disagree with them. However, if there is a difference in doctrine, matters of doctrine and the word of God, we need to mark that difference, and we cannot yoke up with them. Now, these men were teaching the word of God. They were in agreement under the word of God. It wasn't opinion. It was the word. It brought great unity among the Christians, both Jew and Gentile. It's a beautiful thing when you see people from different cultures, nations, tongues, races, fellowshipping in the Lord. It's wonderful. In fact, I would say one of the most impactful things in my life has been times when I was overseas or, or with a different group of people from a different country, a different race, a different nationality, even, even in Mexico, a different tongue. But we could fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a great reminder that God's bigger than just 7645 Winton Road. It's a wonderful thing to know that there are people all over the globe who love Jesus and who listen to his word. I love it. It's a wonderful thing that these men were doing here. Finally, tonight, as we look at this last section, we see this opportunity for the gospel to continue. But we do see a gracious disagreement. In verse 36, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city, where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. Now they agree to do one thing. They said, let's go and check up on all the churches that we started in Asia. They said, wouldn't it be wonderful? By the way, it, it's, it had been approximately three years since their first mission trip ended. Since it ended. So three years at least since they've seen any of those people. And for some, more than that. And you can imagine in their heart, they're thinking of names. Whoops. They're thinking of names, and they're thinking of people, and they're thinking of faces in those churches that they had started, remember, in all those cities. And they're thinking about that man that was ordained as the pastor. I can't wait to see him again. I can't wait to see that, that wonderful family that took us into their home and, and showed us such kindness and hospitality. I can't wait to see that young fellow that we led to Christ that day when he was just walking up and down the street by the market. We thought he'd never get saved. Do you remember when he... I, you can just imagine the joy in their hearts as they thought, we're going to go back and see them, and we're going to encourage them, and maybe even see some more people saved and start some more churches. Man, they were excited. They agreed to go and to confirm and check on those churches. See how they do, it says in verse 36. But verse 37, the contention, the difference starts. Here's the first viewpoint. Verse 37, a Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. So Barnabas says, maybe these guys were having a cup of coffee. Maybe not if you're offended by that. <laughs> they were having a glass of water. And they were sitting across the table and they said, all right, let's get this, let's get this thing started. So we're going to go back to where we came from. And Barnabas says, yeah, so I'll talk to John Mark. We'll get him on board. It'll be great. Verse 38. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them. 
who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And you can almost see Paul, who was leaning back maybe with a smile on his face, lean forward and his face drew a little more stern. And he leaned over to Barnabas and said, John Mark, the one who left us after our first stop on the last trip? And the contention began. Barnabas says, let's take John Mark. I wonder why. Well, one reason could be Colossians 4.10 tells us they were cousins. Barnabas and John Mark were cousins. Maybe he thought, this is my cousin. I can trust him. I know who he is. I know his background. Come on, we're going to take it. It's been three years at least. Let's take it. Maybe, maybe, Maybe Barnabas had in his heart, we need to give the kid a second chance. You know, he was a little overwhelmed at first. Now that he's heard what God did, he's fired up. He's ready to go. Maybe it was a second chance. Maybe he thought that spending time with Barnabas and Paul could mentor John Mark. Maybe they thought, we'll bring this young fellow along, or or this young man along with us, and we'll mentor him. And we'll teach him what it is to be a missionary for Jesus. We'll teach him what it is to give your life for the Lord. But Paul had a different viewpoint. Paul's viewpoint said, well, let's not take him because he deserted us at the very beginning last time. By the way, Barnabas, do you remember? He left us during the hard part. We had just gotten to land. We had to go through all the mountains, the mosquito-infested mountains, where there's robbers and all kinds of crazy things that go on, when it would have been great to have a third man with us, and he left. He's not got the heart for it. And Paul was a no-nonsense kind of guy. We gather that from Scripture, don't we? The overall ministry was at stake, so I can see that how maybe Paul thought, listen, there's too much at stake to try this again. Maybe Paul was thinking spiritually, and he was thinking that, you know, the Bible, Jesus said that he that is faithful in the least will be faithful in much. And that first round, he wasn't even faithful past the first stop, man. He's not going to cut it this time. Nonetheless, they had a disagreement, a sharp contention, the Bible says. Verse 39, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. It almost seems hard to believe. They chose to go their separate ways. Not out of hatred, but because they, because they could not agree on this matter. Can two walk together except they be agreed? So they decided to go to their separate ways. Verse 39 says, And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Sound familiar? That's where the first stop was the last time. They left Antioch and they sailed to Cyprus. Barnabas thought, let's just start all over again. Verse 40 says, And Paul chose Silas. Did you remember verse 34? Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. God left his man there for a reason. So Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Which way did Paul go? Well, he went north and then west, confirming the churches. You know, we don't hear any word about Barnabas and John Mark after this. Paul mentions them briefly in a couple of his letters, but we don't hear anything about their journey. That doesn't mean that it wasn't blessed of God or that they didn't have fruit. It just means we don't hear anything about it. But what we do see is the very next verse and the very next chapter speaks of Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and Silas, coming to Derby. Here's what I want us to notice tonight. Sometimes God uses disagreements between his servants to spread the gospel to different areas in different ways. It's also okay to disagree. We don't all have to see things exactly the same way in matters like this. In matters that are not spelled out in the Bible, we don't have to see everything exactly the same way. It's okay to disagree. We can be gracious about it. We're all saved by the grace of God, and we have the same opportunity to exhibit the grace of God, especially in our disagreements. And we see that tonight. Paul speaks favorably of John Mark later in the Bible and also of Barnabas. He says, when he comes to you, do not deny him. We're going to disagree on matters from time to time. 
question is, will we be pleasing to God even when we disagree? If you'd stand with me, please, and our musicians would come. As we prepare for a time of invitation...